I'm going to talk about the work that we do at Terraform One. We share a wonderful space. It's kind of a, a architecture slash science, biohacking, and general hacking uh, building space called the Metropolitan Exchange in uh, in Brooklyn, New York. Where if there was ever a chance for utopia, it would not happen in Manhattan. It would happen in Brooklyn. There's just more room to evolve. Uh, and we're a collection of mechanical engineers and and, and uh, poets, and, uh, roboticists, nanotech people. And we started many years ago uh, a, a group called BioWorks with my uh, roommate at Harvard, Dr. Oliver Medvedek, who later met Ellen. Uh, and I'll show that work at the end, some of the new stuff that we're doing for International Genetic Engineering Machines uh, Conference, which is due in just about two weeks. So uh, this was uh, a, a work that we had done previously. This was uh, uh, me on the cover of Popular Science talking about future cities. Uh, I'm sorry. I guess I can formally apologize to you guys here. It didn't quite happen. Uh, I, I never promised anything like this was going to happen. I think that what the discussion was, future cities are about the speculation of the narrative. If we didn't have Jules Verne thinking about how to get to the moon when he was on an island in Paris and writing a couple of books, or I think it was something like 80 of them, we wouldn't have those NASA engineers using it as a kind of a, 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 a directive to bring us to the moon. So we use those things as, as, as a form of urbaneering, or thinking about the city as a collective. And we do that at all different scales. So I'm not an urban designer that just focuses on the city. We work with technologies that are, at, that are brand new, on the edge, and open, and try and think about uh, scenarios or a kind of a fictive narrative that imagine the world, uh, what it would be like if those technologies were much more ubiquitous. Uh, so here would be a simple grammar that we deploy. This, in this case, uh, a kind of a signal to changing the grid of a, of a city. Uh, this one making it 100% uh, self-reliant. So going from the grid that you see there from the 50s to, is there a point? Uh, to something like uh, a grid in the, in the near future where green space uh, occupies where buildings used to be. And that green space is not naive green space, it's, it's productive green. Waste, food, energy, water, these are the signals. So we take a map, we do a textbook analysis of an area that was downtown Brooklyn, and then we begin altering it in a physical computer. Uh, we have about 40 to 50 architects, a activists, uh, folks that are interested in their communities at the table at once. So it's not Le Corbusier or Frank Lloyd Wright or this kind of grandpa's version of visioning utopias. It's getting the players on the table without necessarily a big private developer that would influence it with lots of, you know, dosh. Uh, instead, it would be folks that want to see a maximal condition happening and use it as a kind of a polemical piece. We do kinds of drawings. This one was a kind of a replacement for uh, Central Park, using it as an area that would produce biofuel as one example. Here's another version of the model. Uh, a close-up version of the water's edge. We redid the Brooklyn Navy Yard, 300 acres of unused space in New York City that needed something to happen there, uh, I guess, since the Korean War. So we were revamping the dry docks for clean tech usage. Uh, here's kind of a drawing, turbidity barrier, barriers are those uh, kind of star-like shapes on the edge, which show what uh, happens when you want to think about restorative ecology at large scale and doing some research in that area. These are some of uh, uh, the other views of the office towers that kind of link up where you would have incubator businesses on the edge of the dry docks. Uh, you're kind of another overall view of this model, very big collaborative effort, took about four or five months. Uh, that is now part of the uh, permanent, uh, the museum at the Navy Yard. Uh, here is a kind of a selection of, of another area of downtown Brooklyn. And I guess this image really creates a meme. And that is it's not um, cities that celebrate centers that, that, that are so, uh, uh, so much about the previous centuries. Many of the European cities were always celebrating something like religion or spirituality. So there'd be a cathedral in the center of your city. And, and I think uh, after some time, we've had cities that have, have kind of changed where the, the new cathedrals are downtown cores or celebrating commercialism or capitalism. And you get these the kind of icons of skyscrapers that you see so many architects of the previous generation producing. We think the spectacle of the new city as groups of urbaneers is not going to be skyscrapers or cathedrals, but it will be a belief in the kind of the things that keep us alive, the stuff of life, the metabolism of a city. It would be its infrastructure. People would be proud of the things that keep us moving and breathing and healthy, that deliver us food, etc. And so you can imagine this, these kind of centers or series of nodes would be the net itself, and there'd be moments, like in this case, where a kind of a waste to energy plant would be the new uh, kind of uh, 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 spectacle for a city. And then here we are looking at more recent work, uh, areas of uh, section of Governor's Hook, 
Uh, this, this kind of describes uh, the, the field that we, that we have been inventing, very different than urban design or planning. It's a kind of a revamp. Here uh, we call it urbaneering. It's a mixture of uh, you know, mom and pops doing kind of active agency urbanism, uh, garden on the roof, et cetera, to very sophisticated, if not, I shouldn't say elite, but architects or planners that have a, a very different view and an academic view of cities. So uh, it, 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 for more simple terms, it would be like if James, Jane Jacobs uh, had sex with Robert Moses, and they created a child, and you would get Frederick Law Olmsted, who created landscape architecture, created the New York City Parks Department, radically changed how we think about cities forever. So, what we, so we wanted this to be the kind of motif for urbaneering. Uh, here's another view of Governor's Island, the more recent project. Uh, up on the top is a historic preservation uh, uh, area that cannot be changed, and below it is a merger of the existing Red Hook Brooklyn, bleeding it into the island, accessing both spaces, using gabions to create a riparian corridor, and doing it as much as possible ecologically, connecting, removing parts of the East River and then connecting them with new development. Uh, and this is another view of that particular future city. And here it is again. The central tower would be kind of this a kind of a, a, a locus point for culture uh, and then areas for housing. And then other projects, much different than the city itself, that kind of get into how uh, I understand organic movement uh, in cities. This was a, a, kind of a project I did at MIT when I was doing my uh, dissertation there on the future car. I cannot unpack all of it. But one kind of curious notion is can we make cars soft? So this is an air quilt system, pneumatic bladders within bladders, making a car as soft as possible. In fact, I called it the hug and kiss lamb car, something you'd probably be fired for if you were working as an engineer at General Motors. It was a car that made it impossible to die in a car accident. First principle of design. So I mean, it didn't, it didn't need to go 35, it didn't need to go faster than 35 miles per hour. Everything in it was soft. Uh, it, was, it was super connected and networked. In fact, the entire wheel had the drivetrain suspension and motoring all locked in there with a modicum of intelligence. Uh, if it hit your sister, it would tickle her, it wouldn't kill her. It's about the weight of a couple of beach balls. And then how do you phase them into cities? Well, you start getting these kind of intelligent uh, soft cars clustering in flocks and herds. And when they find a Hummer on the road, kind of surround it and push it off to the side as they kind of take over the streets. And here's the one that was actually built, took 10 years. It was about 14 of us at MIT for years working on this. It's Hiroko, I mean, city car, Korean money uh, produced in, in, in the Basque countryside. And, and you can purchase one for about 16,000 euros. So that's uh, one of the vehicles that we've had. It was a whole lexicon of ideas, rethinking cars. And then rethinking housing, making it absolutely green is, uh, was another goal that we, that we had in this project. So it's taking a technology 2,500 years old called pleaching, grafting an osculate matter to one contiguous vascular system. You can do it with woody plants, trees, anything that grows. We use CNC to shape it into a specific volume, and it becomes a home called the Fab Tree Hab. It's a home that respects all life around it. It connects to the metabolism of, of, metabolism of the earth. It is a part of the landscape. The outside is the outside. There's kind of no difference between landscape and home. You can grow a, a kind of a village of these for thousands of families, not with a zero impact on the landscape or not a kind of an efficiency model, uh, but something that would be a positive contribution to the ecology. Accountable for 100 years of pollution, these would scrub the air and certainly service that. Uh, that's another view for the MoMA, the model that we had. This is kind of showing that's growing. Uh, you know, it's very cool to have an architect that, uh, to be an architect that has a project that you know got pretty popular with kids. Uh, and I get dozens of letters all the time from uh, little ones saying they want to, you know, want to live in a treehouse with their parents and they want to grow up and you know be an architect and stop polluting the environment, etc. You know, I always kind of push them to think you probably don't want to be an architect. To think uh, investment banking or something. Uh, so th this is the lab that uh, Oliver and I started, and then Ellen came along. It's now GenSpace, which is really called BioWorks. We were an architecture office that decided to put $15,000 into eBay by getting equipment online that I had no idea what it was, like autoclaves and various types of centrifuges and laminar flow hoods, instead of buying a 3D printer. I thought all cool architects had 3D printers. We said, forget it, let's try the biolab thing. We did, we got our biologists, and off we went making a bunch of these projects. So I'll show you the chair and uh, something called the meat house. 
Uh, this was done with a student at Harvard who wrote a paper about using a modified inkjet printer to print extracellular matrix from cells into a specific geometry, folding them up on PGA scaffolds and creating any shape that you want. Here is a bladder that you can certainly do that. This would be for patients who have prostate cancer. There was an article in the New York Times just a couple of days ago talking about this technology. Please don't send me that link. Everyone on the planet sends me that link. I read it. We knew about it. It's called tissue engineering. So we took that and started thinking about, well, what can we do with this technology? Architects love geometry and making things. So here we had our lab. The proposition that we had there was that we can make leather belts and shoes and handbags, et cetera, where no sentient creature is harmed, completely victimless industrial design, and also thinking about the size or scaling it up to the size of a house. If I didn't build and buy the equipment for a laboratory, I would have no idea what the limitations are of molecular cell biology. So here is a proposition for a home. Uh, I don't have, is there a zapper? Well, it doesn't matter. You can see on, the, on your left-hand side is a typical uh, stud wall construction in most American homes made of wood. On the right side is what we call a meat house or the meat tectonics where we've got fatty cells for insulation and cellula for wind loads and sphincter muscles for doors and windows. And that was the kind of the, the operation for thinking about uh, the meat house. Here's what it looks like. I have no idea what it's supposed to look like. Uh, you know, if you think of Louis Kahn, this great American architect getting dissertations about what a brick should be. Uh, I have no idea what the meat should be, so we kind of came up with all these different forms and possibilities. Uh, this is the one that's there. It's essentially a beef jerky. Uh, it has a very long shelf life, like Twinkies. Uh, it could be any shape you'd like to be in, but a uh, you know, fully grown biological house. It's not Frank Lloyd Wright's version of organic architecture. It's actually organic architecture. Uh, it has to be designed to die because it's very difficult to keep it alive. You have to keep it in a contained atmosphere. It has no immunological system. It is very specific tissue engineering. We know we can do it. We know how it's controlled and kind of excited about it. And so we put the meat house in front of this. We had a big show in Prague in front of the cathedral so religion can confront the house of meat. And then uh, other projects we do about activating the city using waste and growing waste uh, into very specific shapes. Here is these, these typical things that make dumb bricks or bales of trash. We call this project Rapid Refuse. We use it to kind of communicate the amount of waste that a uh, city like New York produces every day. So this is one hour tower. It's larger than the Statue of Liberty. I think it's 38,000 or 36,000 tons of trash per day in the city of New York. So this hopefully communicates to Homer Simpson how much waste we possibly make. We often try and, and, and get that home. Uh, we use waste here, cellulosic matter, in the lab. It's grown through mycelium, or a strain of reishi, to show that we can uh, kind of change the properties of waste, in this case, into a mushroom. Uh, and we made a, this very square brick-like mushroom for the Museum of Contemporary Art, projected it on the surface, the new museum. Uh, this is actually one big mushroom. It's fairly rock hard. Ecovative is a company we are licensed with. They manufacture similar material. We've been experimenting with it forever. We cast it in aluminum for the architects around here who know about the properties of water and shearing forces. Uh, it's, it's much better to do it uh, with aluminum as, as a kind of a wrapper, which has an endless recyclability. And then here showing a, what we call 24-hour tower. So if one hour worth of waste is the Statue of Liberty in New York City, 24 hours is a 53-story skyscraper every day in New York City made out of waste. So I hope that kind of hits, hits it home about the amount of stuff we put in landfills in America. And we took a project uh, on the road uh, here in Darmstadt in Germany, showing them the amount of e-waste they produce, which is styrofoam filled up a room a little bit bigger than this, had a bunch of German students, very exact, and started producing these robots with uh, QR tags that let them know, uh, or anyone could find out about the waste that they're throwing out every week in the city of Darmstadt. Here's one it was 38 feet tall, made with styrofoam and a little bit of wood, and showing it in the, in the museum. Uh, this picture we did not doctor. Uh, it was very cool, or it was very weird, because the, the sanitation truck immediately came as soon as we put it in a public space. Germans, I guess, are very clean. And they circled around the, the project thinking whether it was art or trash or art or trash. And they decided to kind of throw it out uh, after about five minutes and we just, you know, said, please don't. Uh, and they came to our opening. And the final project is a kind of a, a culmination getting way down in scale from the city. This is called GenSeat. Uh, this is what we have been doing with GenSpace. It is looking at what the next industrial revolution truly is using things like computation and 3D printing, but getting into biohacking and genetic, uh, uh, synthetic biology and genetic engineering. So this is a chair that's much different. This is our space in Brooklyn, New York that we share side by side with our biologist friends. 
Uh, and these are some of the materials we were looking at. Uh, this is Acetobacter, which is a kind of a bacteria. Uh, mycelium, again, because we got really good with it. The mushroom uh, that we have been working with, strains of reishi, and the Acetobacter came from kombucha. And then uh, what architects love to do is combine things. So we're thinking plywood, take all these biomaterials, laminate them together, and get a unique biocomposite or biopolymer material and make uh, some object out of it that everyone can relate to. So we thought, you know, the usual architectural things, maybe a brick lump, something like that, but no, we decided to go for a chair. Uh, this is the kind of how we layer the chair together, the cellulosic structure underneath. We express chitin genetically inside the acetobacter, which is very different, uh, and, and then layer it over uh, the kind of the stuffing or the inside, which would be the mycelium or the mushroom. It grows in seven days, pretty good. Uh, it goes from, uh, it takes up any kind of waste material like I showed in the previous project and eats it away and becomes this hard like substance. That's uh, for, the thumbtacks are there for scale. That's the, the, uh, the uh, chitin expressed acetobacter over the uh, mushroom material. That is the kind of geometry that we had produced. Melanie Fessel, my partner, uh, genius, without her this probably would never happen. Uh, it's, it's got a, a certain degrees of freedom. The design was purposely to be a coccyx because you're gonna sit on it, so it's a coccyx for your coccyx, uh, kind of a tailbone on top of your tailbone. And that is the kind of the final view of this, uh, this chair. I think it absolutely replaces industrial design as we know it. If you think about the mid-century designs of Charles and Ray Eames, that was a spectacle of the merger of manufacturability and unitized volumes and modularity. And I think I'm personally kind of done with it. They probably can't supersede what they've already achieved. Uh, it's certainly not craft as we know it from colonial times where it's individual chairs. Instead, it's a new kind of craft, one that uses biology and genetics to tweak anything to whatever we could possibly imagine. And we're not sure what the limitations of those imaginations are, or your imagination or mine, but uh, I think the possibilities seem to be unlimited. So that's a really quick review of the work. Thank you very much. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you.